Uh, David Lane, welcome to Australian Musician. Thanks for having me. Uh, you've got this great new album, uh, Don't Bank Your Heart On It, coming out on November 13. Uh, has bringing an album out during a pandemic made it easier or harder? Uh, well, yeah, that's an interesting question. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't really make overall a huge difference for me. Um, yeah, I mean, ordinarily, the, one of the, the real, the only real bugbear I have with releasing a, an album in a pandemic is like ordinarily right about now, I'd be doing press things, obviously doing stuff like this, and also be booking shows and, and getting in a van and going away on tour. And obviously that's, um, that particular rug has been, <laughs> been pulled, pulled from under us. But um, uh, yeah, so, uh, so to kind of, to, to make up for that, they've been, um, I have been making a lot of, you know, the, the, the whole thing is like, well, you got to create this online content. So um, I've been doing, a lot of that, which is fine, but it's not, you know, like uh, I, I was, I think last week I was kind of lamenting the fact I was like just on Final Cut Pro and it's like, I, I didn't make an album to be fucking editing videos all day. But, um, but I guess that's, you know, like I've, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful now to have the, uh, have the skill of um, uh, editing, editing videos, which is, which is, something that I picked up in this pandemic time, but um, it's not something I, I, I really want to make a habit of if I can help it. Well, it's the, the this record was kind of like, um, there are a bunch of kind of uh, life experiences that informed and inspired the making of this record, um, which is kind of a, a different, a different way of doing it for me because well, because I'm such a, a music a fan of music and I love if I get obsessed by a record or I get obsessed by a certain artist I go oh I want to make something that sounds like that and this is probably the first time where I've just let the experiences of my life shape uh, whatever the record turns out to be and um, it's something that I kept reminding myself um, th through a particularly um, kind of uh, uh, trepidatious time in my life a couple of years ago um, when, you know, like you, 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 you uh, yeah, you, you, you get your heart broken and, and, and you just remind, well, don't bank your heart on it. So I don't know, I don't know why. Like, I, and, I don't know. It's not something that I, I think I'd even heard somewhere else. It was just a phrase that kept popping back up in my head. And a lot of these songs are to do with that particular time. So it's like, oh, fuck, well, you know, don't bank your heart on it. Kind of, um, it, it, it rolls off the tongue. There's such a wide variety of styles on the album. Were you concerned at all uh, about how, how diverse it would be? No, um, yeah, I, it, it's it's funny. That's that that but the whole thing of of um, cohesion in a record has never really been something that r really bothers me too much. I remember like the the first kind of um, you know like re reading about bands when you when you're growing up as a as a young music fan and like you know you you. Uh, I'm just yeah, remember being obsessed by certain bands and hearing like you know there was a song that they left off the record because it didn't fit or it is it was a song and then you hear that song and go fucking hell that's incredible why on earth would they have left that off the record and then like it's the whole thing of like well it, it doesn't fit with the cohesion of the of the of the thing and when when you think it like I mean yeah a lot of my favorite records are records that that flip from pretty drastically from style to style. Um, you know, you think of things like um, Smile by the Beach Boys or, or, or um, Song Cycle by Van Dyke Parks and they're records that you literally do not know. I mean, you, you don't know what's coming next. And 
uh, as a music fan, I like to be kept on my toes uh, in, in that regard. So um, I, I guess I kind of make music that reflects that. And even though it, it, it does, you know, all kind of fit under the umbrella of, of rock music at the end of the day, it's, it's I kind of like to be able to go, well, I'm going to do this on this song and then that on that song and that on that song. And yeah, and I'm, I don't have a record company breathing down my neck to tell me that I can't do that. So I guess that's, that's a, that's an advantage. <laughs> yeah. And I guess with the, the mix and the mastering, uh, you, you got the same vibe anyway. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think, yeah, even though there were a few different people, um, a few different people mixing, mix, who mix the record, I, I think there, I think there is a, yeah, I, I remember the first time I sat down and listened to it, the sequence as a, as a whole, it, it didn't, even though the, it, there, there are a few of those kind of sharp left turns, there isn't anything that's like too jarring, I guess. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it it's, it's, um, it's cohesive because I bloody well say it is. <laughs> Uh, 13 tracks on the album. Were there others that you uh, dabbled in? Yeah, there was, there were a couple of other songs that there was one song. Um, uh, there was one song called uh, uh, You Broke Hers, Now I Break Yours, which I was going to have, um, which I was going to, going to do with uh, Olympia. She was going to sing on that. Um, but that was just, uh, yeah, just due to time constraints and, and, um, you know, what it was, it was at the, 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 the time I was kind of getting the record all, all, all kind of tightened up was, was the time that Melbourne went into its, you know, its most draconian of, of lockdown. So that kind of, I, I kind of just had to take stock and go, all right, well, I'm, I'm just going to, um, just have to finish with what I've got, but that but that song's kind of half finished, so I'd like to do finish that off with a at some point. Yeah, um, there are a lot of guests on the album. Were any of the songs written with the guest artists in mind? Um, yeah, uh, not particularly. Um, I guess if anything, like acceptance was. I remember. I, I remember when I wrote that, and putting there are a couple of chord changes in there that I um I remember I remember like working out the chord like kind of writing the chords for the verse part and thinking, oh that's a little bit Todd Rundgren. That's what Todd Rundgren might have done. And um that was probably about a year before he came out and toured out here and we kind of hung out and got to know each other and um so I mean, and and that kind of set the tone. Really, it was more like, oh, I've got this this yeah. Like it was more just kind of thinking back to that thing of going, oh, that's a little bit Todd Rundgren, and then go, do you know what would be really great if I got Todd Rundgren to bloody sing on it? And you know, you can only ask. And with with yeah, him. It, I mean, that was just fortuitous that that kind of turned out the, the way it did. And we we did that record and. There's another song that we're working on called Someday, which is going on Todd's next record that comes out next year. Right. So, um, yeah, but apart from, yeah, apart from that, well, maybe with the, 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 there's a song that Jimmy Barnes sings on and basically that, that song is uh, needed a, 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 a really intense screaming high belted vocal and which is like way out of my range as a singer and again I, I, I thought well you can only ask and um, and um, and and he, he yeah he was up for it and yeah but the song that there's a song that Robin Hitchcock is on and basically like I, I was trying to write like a Sid Barrett song anyway and 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 in in the time that we uh, in in the time that you know Robin and I I've been playing with Robin um, doing shows here and in in the UK over the last few years, um, 
you know, I think about 30% of our, our time together is, is spent talking about Sid Barrett. So um, I thought it'd be, yeah, I just, I just, and I just thought it'd really suit Robin's voice. So yeah, yeah it was more a matter of, 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 of kind of writing the song and, and, and going, well, oh, do you know, it'd be really cool if I got, you know, such and such a person on it. And, and that was, yeah, that was more so the, um, the motivation for it rather than go like, um, you know, wanting to rope all my famous, more popular mates in to, to, to give me a leg up. <laughs> yeah. Um, just going back, <laughs> just going back to Todd, um, you did tour with him. Uh, was that last year? Uh, it was two years, almost exactly two years ago. Wow, time flies. Um, I know. Yeah. What, what was that experience like? Ah, oh, incredible. Um, and, you know, we talk about, I was talking about the time of my, of my life that inspired the title of the record. And that was kind of around the time that that was, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the two with Todd kind of ran concurrently with that. And um, I just remember what a, a, um, a life-affirming experience it, it, it was playing that music w with him. And, you know, there's that old, old thing of like, never meet, never meet your heroes. And, and that was, that was one, that was one thing where we were like, you know, none of us had met him before. Um, I'd actually met him a couple of times. I'd supported him, but just very briefly, but um, we we're like, Oh, you know, like, and all the guys, me and all, all the fellas in the band were all huge fans of his. And we we're like, Oh, what if he turns out to be an asshole? Like, like it, it's it's that thing of like I've I've, I've kind of met heroes before, uh, um, musical heroes of mine, and and had like really awful experiences, <laughs> and it just kind of ruins their music for you. But um, we got in the room, and Todd was just a joy to be around. He was so lovely. Tell me about the guitars that you used on the album. Ah, well, I have some of them here. Um, oh, let me have a look. Um, I use my, I use this, I use my Strat quite a bit, which is um, basically just a, um, it's, this is like a Japanese all parts neck and I, I've got a Fender Nocaster, which is, which has that really chunky baseball bat neck and um, Basically, just just bought all the bits. This is like a like a vintage loaded pick guard and sonic blue body and um, older body and and just yeah, just kind of bought all the bits and put it together. And it's one of my favourite guitars. And it's it's funny. I, I've always uh, yeah, I've always had an aversion to Stratocasters for some reason. I, I always thought, well, that's kind of like you know, it doesn't get any more kind of like white man blues than, than playing a Stratocaster, but you know, as I, as I age, I, 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 I'm, I'm warming to it a lot more. I remember, um, I remember, uh, you and I did a tour about 20 years ago with the Strokes and Albert Hammond Jr. was, was, was like, Oh, what's he playing a Strat for? And then it's like, as the tour went on, it's like, Actually, this guy's making the strap really fucking cool. Um, so yeah, so the, the, this is, I'll probably use this more than any other guitar on the record. Um, what else have I got here? I've got this, which is a, it's actually just a Chinese, it's just a cheap Chinese 12 string. And, um, and but I, I, I um, yeah, I've got some, um, redid the pickups and the, and the wiring and it works, it, 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 it works beautifully. And, you know, like I, a, a, an actual Rickenbacker 12 strings kind of out of my budget at the moment. So, so this, this works, this does me just fine. Um, and also, um, also this one, which is my, my Brian May red special, which I made with um, 
made with a friend of mine about 10 years ago now. And I actually, if you can see here, I actually had it, I actually had it signed by the, by the great man himself. Okay. A few, um, a few years ago too. So that, so this is, yeah, this guitar has a huge sentimental attachment for me, but, um, I use this quite a bit on the record too. Yeah. Um, uh, Begami Palindrome uh, has beautiful acoustic uh, guitar sound. Uh, what was yeah. It, what was the gu guitar and how did you mic it? Good question. Um, this is it's this guitar, which is a um, I use this guitar for all the acoustics on the record. It's actually called it's called Working Dog, and um, they're made by a, a guy, a guy who, a, Mel, a local Melbourne guy, who makes, yeah, who makes some amazing acoustic guitars. And he built this one specially for me about two or three years ago. And basically, it's like a, I wanted something along the lines of like your Gibson um, J200 or whatever. Um, I could have that completely wrong. But, um, Again, I got him to make it with a with a, like a, a super chunky neck, and I um, yeah. So so I used this for all the acoustic guitar stuff on the record. For that particular song, I had everything tuned down a whole step down to uh, like DGC FAD, and um, and how did I mic it up? I can't remember. I've got this mic here, which is. <coughs> Um, which is a, a bee's knees U47 clone. And I use that for pretty much, uh, for, oh, I definitely, oh, definitely used it for all my vocals on the record. And I probably would have just mic'd that up with, um, the, the, the 40, with the 47 somewhere around here. And, um, well, what other mic would I have used? I probably would have, yeah, had this one, which is a, um, a road classic to uh, I can't uh, it's got a particularly tight mic stand uh, yeah I, uh, this one's a road classic too so I probably would have had that pointed somewhere around here and have that picking up the body and just just had them have them running in stereo and and um, through a um, my pre over there which is a it's a Chandler red pre um, which I use for everything. So that that would have been that would have been the 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 the, um, the signal chain for that. Yeah. Um, I look inside has a great uh, synth sound. Was that an analog yeah. analog synth or? Uh, m mostly not. Mostly not. I've got. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to. I'd like to be able to um, build up a bit of a collection of synthesizers, but. Actually, mainly I use I use this, which is it's um, just with my MIDI controller, which is just like a Roland um, JU06A, which is like basically the the brain of a of a Juno. So I kind of had that um, had that linked up to um, to my MIDI controller and just run, run that straight into Pro Tools. But there, there were some other synth sounds on there that. Um, that I just, yeah, I just would have a view software since for like, there was a, um, I could see a Yamaha CS80 software synth and yeah, so pretty much just, just the, that, the CS80 and this. Yeah. yeah you, you managed to get a very authentic sounding, uh, or very analog sound out of it anyway. Oh, thank, thank you very much. I, um, I, I did run everything through. Yeah, I mean, with that, with software synth stuff, I tend to, um, I tend to run everything through like, you know, a million different tape emulators just to kind of juice it up a bit and, and, um, and, and just, just, you know, just take some of that digital kind of harshness off the top. Uh, uh, the new singles, uh, You Were a Mirage, uh, in the clip, that song, you're playing guitar, piano and drums. Uh, was that the case on the recording? Um, 
No, well, I, I, uh, Brett Wolfenden, who plays drums with me, he plays drums on that song. Um, he plays drums on quite a bit of the record, but um, uh, yeah, I, that, that one song was, I think it was Brett playing drums and I played everything else myself. So um, he, um, yeah, and, and, and it, again, we made that clip um, in, at, at the height of, of the, the kind of lockdown scenario. So having more than two people in a room at, at one time was, was, was not entirely legal. So, so, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I play, I play a lot of drums myself. I'm, you know, every guitar player is a frustrated drummer, aren't they? So, and I'm no exception to that. <laughs> So you've got a kit there in your home studio? Or? I do, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let me just, well, I'll just flip it around. There, I've actually got, just got my light there. But it's an, uh, it's a six, it's a 60s Premier, which is um, a really lovely sounding kit. And, um, uh, that is, um, yeah, I, I, I use that with the, uh, I've got, I've got the snare over there, which is, I think I, it's a Ludwig snare. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's called like a standard or something like that. It's like a, like at the time, uh, it was like a, a student version of the, of uh, the jazz festival snare. And that's a really killer sounding wood snare. So I use that on, on, everything that I record drums with at home. Yeah. Um, how important is the track order for you with an album? Um, oh, well, I think, I think for this record, for this record, the track order kind of informed itself because it has, um, uh, yeah, I mean, as the songs were starting to build up and the songs were starting to take shape, I realised that within this set of songs was a kind of a story of sorts. So um, I, I, I tend to found that, you know, there is this arc of, like, of, of falling out of love and then falling in love and then having that, blow up in your face and then questioning your own existence and then coming out of that into into this like you know the themes of the last two songs are uh, acceptance and and I'm your wonderful and 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 those are kind of you know like I didn't I even though there are some bleak things on the record I didn't want it to to I, I did want it to have like a little glimmer of hope at the end but I, I think yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, obviously we, we could spend hours talking about the validity of, of the, the album as a, as a, as an, you know, as a standalone form of, of art and, and how obviously that's been kind of, that's kind of been thrown, thrown to the wind with the, with the advent of streaming and all that kind of thing. But I think, yeah, I mean, I, I for me, some of the most formative experiences for me musically were albums that, and I know this is like, this is such a cliche to, to say, but um, albums that do take you on a journey and start somewhere and make you feel a certain way. And then, you know, like, and then, and then, you know, and then make you feel this and then make you feel that and then have a start and an end point. And I think that's incredibly important. Yeah, um, there's a lot of production on the album. Uh, when you do get to the stage where you can play live again, uh, will yeah. it be a difficult album to reproduce, or would you even want to reproduce yes. everything? Yeah, it will be a difficult album to reproduce. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's funny. I go into every time I go into making a record. I always, there's always a little, you know, the little person on the shoulder that says, now don't make it too difficult to play live when you can. <laughs> and then the, the, the other, the other one on the other shoulder goes, nah, fuck it. Like it, just fucking take it as far as you can take it. And don't worry about playing live. You cross that bridge when you get to it. 
and um, so and 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 that's the that's the guy that when it comes to playing live, I always turn around and go, "Fuck you! Why did you tell me to do that?" Um, but I, yeah, I, I, um, I, yeah, and but but in a way, I enjoy that because it makes it it makes playing live. Um, it makes those kind of things. I'll, I'm always up for a challenge, and and there are enough songs on the record that um, I, I, you can kind of like uh, more of a visceral kind of thing where you don't, you know, I'm not concentrating on like, you know, like 300 different inversions of chords and things like that. It's so there are songs where I can just like switch off and, and, and let it take me wherever it takes me. Yeah. Um, with COVID restrictions easing, uh, what are the plans for the rest of the year and into next year? Um, well, I guess we're, we're in November now, so it's going to take a little while to, um, I, I, I do like even, I, I know this morning we, I, I've been having discussions with people about, um, like my, my bookers and, and whatnot about getting into, um, you know, regional regional kind of things. I think, you know, New South Wales at the moment is probably like a, a, quite, a, you know, a, a bit ahead of us down here for obvious reasons. So, yeah, I mean, I, but I think like looking into December and January, like there'll be, once things start, start opening up, there'll be openings for, for, for people like myself to start playing again. So I'm, I'm going to be like a, like a, like a, a bull at the gate to um to, to get to play again yeah uh it's a great album uh don't bank your heart on it it's out uh november 13 uh yep. great to chat and uh good luck with uh, getting out there and playing it live thank you so much really appreciate it